What the f just happened? That's insane. That's absolutely insane. Arguably, there is a legal performance enhancer that most of us already have in our homes. Sodium bicarbonate, also known as baking soda, can be found in our kitchens, but it's also changing running and other elite sports such as pro cycling. In today's video, I'm gonna be going through all of the research and science to see if this actually can make you faster. As well as that, I'll be trying it out and doing some testing of my own, while also letting you know which types of sessions it's meant to work for and which athletes are currently using it. So where's all this hype come from? I'm always super skeptical when a new supplement comes on the market and changes the game. But so many athletes seem to be getting benefits from this ergogenic aid or performance enhancer. The Telegraph reported that, it is estimated that more than 80% of elite distance runners are now using bicarb. Absolute gold dust, said one leading coach. It's game changing, add an Olympian. These are bold claims, but with five of the top 10 male 800 meter performances ever coming in the last year, maybe there's something to it. Or is it the ever-changing and progressing super spikes? Olympic gold medalist Keely Hodgkinson openly uses bicarb and ran the seventh fastest time for a female ever last year. You may have already heard that bicarb is great for athletes running shorter events like the 800 meters. But what you may not know is that athletes running much longer events or cycling much longer events are also using it. Bicarb has been extensively used in the pro peloton with a number of teams using it including Team Visma Lisa Bike, formerly Jumbo Visma, and their winner Sepp Kuss, who won the Vuelta in 2023, was using bike up. It's also been reported that the late Kelvin Kipton ran the marathon world record in Chicago with bike up. And there's even runners doing ultra distance events. Tom Evans used bike up in Western States, Killian in UTMB, and David Roach with his record-breaking run in Leadville. With its use increasing all the time across different sports, I wanted to know how it actually works. So I dug deep into the science and the research. So it's been a long time since my chemistry degree, but I really enjoyed going through a number of sources to understand how sodium bicarbonate actually works. I'll try to pitch this at a level that everyone will understand, but if it gets too geeky or if you don't care about the science, then feel free to skip to the next chapter where we explore if it actually works and I get to try it for myself. So there's a number of methods of sodium bicarbonate delivery, and we will discuss these in more depth later because it's really important. I'll let you know how it tastes, any side effects, and I'll give you a few tips how to save some money if you do want to try bicarb. But first, I wanted to skip to how the bicarbonate works once it's in the body. So there's actually a few proposed mechanisms. Let's start with the classic and most widely accepted one. In the blood, bicarbonate acts as an extracellular buffer. What this means is the bicarbonate helps to regulate acid-base balance. You may not know that without taking any supplements, we already have a bicarbonate buffer, which helps keep things balanced in the body. When we then take additional bicarbonate, we aim to increase the level of that bicarbonate, increasing the buffering capacity in the blood, which reduces the acidity of blood. It is also used in medical environments, both orally and intravenously to treat acidotic states, but this is beyond the scope of what we are discussing. So when we exercise intensely, we burn a lot of carbs and metabolism through glycolysis, and as a result, produce high levels of lactate and hydrogen ions. Note, I didn't say lactic acid, as this does not exist in the human body. Lactate is great, historically demonized, but in fact is a very good fuel that we can use in the muscle cells, or it can be shuttled to other cells in the body to be used as fuel. However, the associated hydrogen ions are not so good. They increase the acidity of the cell, this acidosis impacts the muscle's ability to contract, so it's desirable to get the hydrogens out of the cell, so that the muscle can work as effectively as possible. The presence of a higher level of bicarbonate increases the efflux of hydrogen ions from the cell out to where they can be buffered by the bicarbonate. Put a bit more simply, bicarbonate is pulling the hydrogens out of the muscle cell, which allows the muscles to work more effectively, delay fatigue, and means that we can perform better. When the hydrogen ion reacts with the bicarbonate, it produces carbonic acid, which then dissociates into water and carbon dioxide, which can be removed as a waste. So the more bicarbonate you have, the more hydrogen ions you can deal with, delaying muscle acidosis. Once bicarbonate reduces hydrogen ions, the concentration of lacti lactate ions in the blood increases. Firstly, you are creating optimal conditions for glycolysis, which will increase the production of lactate in the muscle cell. And secondly, 
and perhaps more importantly, the bicarbonate would also pull the lactate ions out of the cell into the blood. This increases blood concentration of lactate. But remember, the lactate can be used as a fuel elsewhere in the body. There is another mechanism of action that may be how bicarbonate works. Bicarbonate can change the pH of the cell to a more optimal environment for glycolysis. At high intensities, we need this high level of carb metabolism. So improving the environment for, like, for glycolysis may lead to improved efficiency. A third mechanism that may impact how the sodium bicarbonate may work is through the very high load of sodium. This increases the plasma volume, which can have performance benefits, especially in hot conditions. This high sodium load will drive thirst, and one thing some athletes have found using bicarb is that they are slightly heavier the next day due to taking on more liquid. There's a lot of science, and bicarbonate may be working in a different ways. It's clear that more research needs to be done to know exactly how it may help athletes. But as athletes and coaches, we want to know, does it make us any faster? So does it work? Let's find out what the research says. I quickly found out that sodium bicarbonate use in exercise is not new. Studies exploring its effect date back as far as the 1930s. And when I searched the term sodium bicarbonate and exercise on Google Scholar, I literally got thousands of results. It's actually crazy how well researched it is. I spent many hours reading through studies, but could have easily spent days or even months reading different papers. One of the really extensive and helpful papers was a comprehensive review and analysis by the International Society of Sports Nutrition. Their 37 page paper, looks at the findings of 146 different studies. They found that supplementation with sodium bicarbonate improves performance in muscular endurance activities. The ergogenic effects of sodium bicarbonate are mostly established for exercise tasks of high intensity that last between 30 seconds and 12 minutes. They also stated that long-term use of sodium bicarbonate may enhance training adaptations, but it's important to note that despite stating that the improvements across most of the studies was due to physiological effects, a portion of the ergogenic effects seems to be placebo driven. So there are so many studies showing the benefits of using sodium bicarbonate, but there are some that found no benefits. One of the reasons given for the studies showing no overall benefit is due to the side effects that can come with sodium bicarbonate. So in a paper by Saunders et al, they found that when they reported all of the results, there was no improvement in performance. However, when they excluded those with the worst side effects, there was an improvement in performance. But what are these side effects? Well, taking sodium bicarbonate has traditionally caused stomach ache, bloating, belching or burping, diarrhea, and in some cases, vomiting. Do you remember that experiment you did in school where you added bicarb to vinegar to make an amazing volcano and impress all your friends? Well, that's basically what's happening when you add bicarb to the acidic environment of the stomach. Carbon dioxide is produced and things can get a little bit lively. When you are experiencing these side effects, it can be really difficult to exercise and perform. It should be noted, there is real variability in how people respond to taking bicarb. The most likely way to cause upset is just adding bicarb powder to liquid and drinking it. But there have been attempts to find solutions to the GI issues using delayed release and enteric coatings of capsules and tablets. There has been some success with this, and as mentioned earlier, most of the studies show improvements with bicarb. This is supported by the fact that the International Olympic Committee included sodium bicarbonate in their list of supplements with good to strong evidence of achieving benefits in their consensus statement. So far, the research is indicating good benefits, but the possibility of GI issues, not really worth the risk for a 1-2% to improvement, in my opinion. However, Morton have come up with a new bicarb system that claims to solve these issues using a carb hydrogel and some mini tablets of sodium bicarbonate. The claim is that the carb hydrogel encapsulate the bicarb, allowing easier transportation through the stomach into the intestine. What this implies is all the benefits of bicarb, but without the traditional side effects. I found three studies that have used the Morton. The first was only looking to see if Morton had solved the GI issues and found the near elimination of GI discomfort, whilst also being able to deliver eight millimole per liter of bicarb which is over the threshold of five millimole per litre stated to give an ergogenic effect. I also found these levels stayed higher for longer. The second study had repeated four kilometre time trials on the bike with a 45 minute passive recovery. They found that the bike improved performances and GI discomfort was nearly eliminated. 
And the third study to look at Morton is really interesting because it's a 40 kilometer time trial, which takes approximately an hour. This is far longer than most research states that bicarb is useful for. Again, the bicarb improved performance by 1.4% with minimal GI issues. This all sounds really promising and I'm excited to give it a go. So here we have the Morton bicarb system. It is really expensive, which is why I held off on buying it for so long. It's 15 pound per portion. The amount of bicarb you mix into the hydrogel depends on your body weight. The recommended dose is 0.2 to 0.3 grams per kilogram of body weight. On the Morton website, you put in your weight and experience and it recommends a system for you. What I have done is followed a tip from David Roach, which is to put your body weight as really high, meaning you get the maximum dose of bicarb mini tablets. You can then weigh the correct portion for your weight when you use it and you'll have some mini tablets left over which you can use in a hydrogel on another occasion. Preparing the Morton is really easy. You add the water to the carb powder, you mix it in a bowl that comes with the package, it turns into a gloopy hydrogel, you then add the mini tablets and mix gently. The key is then to eat the mixture without chewing any tablets. I can't design a truly fair test, but I wanted to get an idea of whether the bicarb actually worked by doing two times 20 minutes all out on the bike and seeing how I get on in each. I've chosen 20 minutes because it is a duration I have done before, so I'm more likely to pace it better and it's a bit fairer. So let's get stuck into the bike car and see how I get on. Right, so we're a couple of hours out from my first test with Morton bike carb, so it's time to dig in. Got to remember not to chew, just trying to swallow the little tablets of bike carb without doing any chewing. And to be honest, it doesn't taste of anything. So taste-wise, absolutely fine. Okay, so I'm not gonna ruin how I got on with the bike carb, but it's been a few days, I've recovered well, and I'm ready to get back on the bike and go all in for another 20 minute test. I am so competitive and I would absolutely love to beat the power that I got with bike carb. So let's see if I can do this. Um, if I can, then maybe I won't need to buy any bike carb and it'll save me a load of money. Just get on the bike and give it everything. 20 minute tests never get easier. That was really, really, really hard. Um, I'll uh, explain the results in a bit. Right then, let's look at the results, some ways to save money and the conclusions. The first test with bike carb shocked me. I felt so strong and averaged 315 watts for the 20 minute test. My heart rate averaged 176 and peaked at 186, which is near my maximum, which I find really hard to achieve on a bike. The lactate after the test was a huge 19 millimole per liter. I'm not sure I've ever seen it that high, but then again, I don't really test on maximal efforts. I got zero GI issues and didn't really feel very different apart from feeling strong on the bike. The second test, I was determined to improve my previous score. This is definitely not a fair test or in any way scientific. I gave it everything and averaged 310 watts. Going into that last five minutes, I knew I was close and I thought a strong finish would help me get a higher overall average than with the bicarb, but I just missed out. So that's a five watts difference over 20 minutes. That's a 1.6% increase using the bicarb it's pretty much what the literature says, but it seems like such a small amount and definitely within testing variability and error. However, there were some other interesting points. I saw from the testing, both my average heart rate and peak heart rate and lactate values after the test were higher in the bicarb test. I really gave it all in both tests and was surprised to see such a difference in heart rate. I made sure I was well fueled for both and fueled during two. Potentially I was a little fitter and a little bit better at 20 minute power tests going into the non bicarb test and if I had done it the other way around, may have seen a bigger difference in results. I also may have seen a bigger difference doing a shorter test and working within that 30 second to 10 minute time frame given by the literature. However, I wanted to do a test I felt more comfortable completing and something more similar to the durations I raced at. Anecdotally, I certainly felt much stronger in the bike card test despite the results being so close. I also started to feel twinges of cramp creeping in towards the end of the non bicarb test where I didn't get any issues with bicarb. It's great that I had some improvements when using bicarb, but I'm just one person, N equals one. My crude testing implies that I do potentially get some benefits, but that doesn't mean everyone does. 
In fact, things such as muscle typology likely play a role in how effective the bicarb is. The more fast twitch fibers you have, the more glycolytic you'll be, and therefore bicarb can potentially have a bigger effect. This is actually a good time to mention how few studies have been done on women, and more needs to be done in this area. Based on the vast number of positive studies and my experience, I hypothesized that it will be beneficial for most athletes, but how big the effect is probably depends and really, I do think there will be variability. The only way to truly know how it will impact you is to try it. The other thing which needs far more testing is how it may or may not impact longer events. It has been suggested that it may help in events such as pro cycling and ultra marathons due to the variable power output that can be involved in these events. In cycling, you have hard climbs, attacks, vital moves, Whereas in ultra running, you might have a hard climb, which you push a bit more on, as long as you're fueling well. Perhaps this is where bicarb can help in the longer events. Would it help in the marathon? I think potentially, if you are able to really push hard towards the end of a well-paced race, but it's difficult to say without further testing personally, and hopefully more studies on longer events being published. The problem with doing studies on longer events is it becomes really difficult to get reliable results and suitable trial participants. So I mentioned earlier that I would give you some ways to potentially save some money. And there is a startup in the UK that provides bicarb and a hydrogel for £30 for six portions. That's £5 a go and £10 cheaper per serving than Morton. The startup is called Bicarb with two R's and I will link to it in the description. Their system involves a bicarb powder mixed with a hydrogel I've tried their system three times. It is a much more difficult mix to eat and tastes like you're eating like congealed seawater. However, after wolfing it down on two of the occasions, I had amazing results. One of my best sessions ever on the bike and a crazy jump in performance on a run where my threshold efforts were coming out at like five, 10 a mile when I'd been doing like the same session basically at 5.30 a mile not long before. I think I may have pushed a bit harder, but 5.10 pace felt so good. However, the other time I took bicarb, I had really bad bloating and burping. It was so bad that I didn't even attempt the session I had planned. I think this shows that even the same person can have variable GI response. The bicarb, I don't know how you meant to say it really, bicarb two hours is so much more affordable, but I think the fact it uses a powder and not mini tablets does increase the risk of GI issues. I'm pretty convinced that bicarb improves my performances and plan to use the cheaper bicarb in training to maximize training effect and adaptations and then potentially save the more palatable and less risky Morton for important race days. Personally, I will continue to test bicarb and see how much of an impact it has on different sessions, both on the bike and running. I don't think it is completely going to change a runner and there are far more benefit from consistency in training. I think it is worth trying to see how much benefit you may or may not get, but unless you're performance driven, then one to 2% may not be worth it. The other things to note is that Morton advised to take it a maximum of twice a week due to the sodium load. We do not know the long-term risks of taking bicarb regularly and anyone with any history of cardiovascular issues should seek the advice from their doctor. One interesting that I found during my research was that sodium bicarbonate is viewed as performance enhancing in the horse racing world. These so-called milkshakes have been banned by many racing authorities when taken within 24 hours of racing. That does lead to the question of whether bicarb will be banned in sports by humans. I don't think it will be due to its prevalence in baking, etc., and the prevalence of other ergogenic supplements such as caffeine being still legal, but it is an interesting topic for debate. I hope you've enjoyed this dive into sodium bicarbonate and its impact on sport. This video could have been hours and there was so much more that could be discussed, including its interaction with other supplements such as caffeine or nitrates, and I would advise people to look into the scientific literature themselves. There are so many free open access papers available and it's so easy to search Google Scholar and find them. We're all different. We all have different GI responses and we all have different physiological responses to bicarb. If you have tried it, I would love to know your experiences in the comments. And if you'd like videos like this on any other topics, then let me know. Thanks a lot and good luck with your training and racing.